Asyl, the Engineer and the Island. Week 15, Day 1. A new week, but the same old routine. Still on downtime waiting for the line. I did find, though, that I haven't been keeping up with the lime switching schedule as consistently as I would like, since I've had to keep stopping every now and then to check on the big sundial left on the beach. Sometimes I let it go too long, most of the time not enough, and I waste time coming back and checking. Sometimes I miss a swap completely because I get too into whatever I'm doing at the moment. To remedy this, after my morning chores, I decided to build a proper clock. If I'm being honest, I'm frankly a bit sick of the giant sundial I built on the beach, because, although it's pretty accurate, it's an eyesore, and except for providing a temporary north-south line, I tore most of it down. I still needed a sundial to calibrate the mechanical clocks I wanted to build, however, and I've always wanted to make a sundial of a particular form, namely of two interwoven rings. I got the idea from an experiment I did back home once, where I ended up having to use a couple of hula hoops to try and build a sundial. I would have liked to have used iron for artistic effect, but for now, bamboo will have to do. I split a couple of pieces and hollowed them out, and used cords like spokes on a bike wheel to make them as close to perfect circles as possible. I then jointed them together and put a large hole at their connection point. This is where sunlight will shine through one side and hit the rim of the rings on the other. I used my protractor to mark different positions on that side of the rings, which will give me the hours and even some of the minutes of the day. I used a couple of poles to mount these rings in the courtyard, far enough away from the solar tower that it won't sit in the tower's shadow, and at the proper angle such that the sunlight will cause a longitudinal ring to always be in shadow from its opposite side, save where the hole lets light through, and oriented properly north-south, so that I'll know when proper noon is. Finally, I piled some rocks up around the support poles and sealed them together with concrete to make a quick and dirty pedestal for the sundial. This didn't take me much more than an hour. It's definitely better than the old sundial, for quick glances at the time of day, and more centrally located, but it doesn't alert me to what time it is if I'm in the middle of something, and for that I need some kind of mechanical clocks, with something like a bell or alarm that I can hear on the other side of the compound. I decided to make at least one grandfather clock for my hut, just because they're cool, and wall clocks for the workshop, lab, and kitchen. I could probably also use a couple of egg timers for cooking and chemical reactions. The grandfather clock was actually kind of easy. Basically, you wind up an axle driving the hands with a spring or weights, but the pendulum has a sort of double ratchet on it that only allows the ratchet wheel on the axle to turn one tick at a time. The length of the pendulum controls how fast it ticks, and as I calculated before, a one meter pendulum will tick at a rate of about once per second. A tick-tock is two seconds, which was easy to measure with my measuring cord, allowing me to cut a rigid pendulum of bamboo, which I topped with a notched crossbar for the ratchet. This in turn told me how many teeth I needed to put on my ratchet wheel which I decided to make from another spoked wheel of bamboo, with little holes in it for the ratchet to grab onto rather than teeth, because that was just easier for me to manufacture. These were easy to set an equal distance apart using my protractor. Every time the pendulum ticks, the ratchet wheel will drag on it a little in one direction or another, imparting just enough energy to the pendulum to keep it going continuously, instead of running out eventually and letting the ratchet wheel run out of control. After that, it was a simple process of making another wheel to turn the minute hand one increment per revolution of the second hand, and one for the minute hand to do the same for the hour hand. I was able to achieve this pretty easily by putting a peg in the second wheel that poked out once a tick and turned the minute hand. Same deal for the hour hand. Saves me from having to make complicated gear trains anyway. I easily mocked up a framework with bamboo, and used stones and cord for the weights, making the position of the weight on the end of the rigid pendulum arm slightly adjustable, so I can check how far off the clock is each day, and adjust the period of each tick to be as accurate as possible. 
The only thing missing was a bell or chime. I obviously couldn't make metal bells, but it occurred to me that glassware kind of rings when you hit it, so I tried to carefully turn a few thin-walled bells or cups on the potting wheel and left them out to dry for the day. In the meantime, I added a mechanism to the grandfather clock that would turn a thin bamboo flicker to hit the bell once a tick when the hour hand engages a peg at the hour mark. Different numbers of pegs are engaged at each hour mark, so the bell will count out the hour. Simple, but very clever, and I like it a lot. I added a switch, though, that would disengage all the pegs once a revolution of the hour hand, that is, during the night, and re-engage them when the hour hand made a second pass, and it was daytime again. It was about lunchtime when I finished with the grandfather clock, just in time to test the lunch chime, which for the moment simply clicked. When I was done, I got back to work, using the same basic mechanism for the wall clocks, but instead of using weights, this time I decided to use a rubber band spring for mechanical power instead of weights, though I had to wait for it to set first. In the meantime, I built a wall clock for the kitchen. I gave it a short pendulum and a single ratchet hook, such that it had a period of only half a second, but grabbed the ratchet wheel once a second, for simplicity. This required a pendulum only 24.8 centimeters long. This one I could afford to make a little smaller, so I made a clay cover for it stylized to look like a cat, because I could, and because it's been a long time since I've seen a cat. I decided to make it look like one of those lucky Japanese cats, but modified the flicker mechanism so it moved the cat's paw to hit a bell hanging near it. Fun. The other paw will appear to be holding a fish. The clock I built for the workshop I used to experiment with a spring mass oscillator instead of a pendulum, like I've seen in old-timey pocket watches. This one, in place of a pendulum, used a ceramic disc and a rubber band which are wound up. As they unwind, the accelerated mass of the disc starts rewinding the spring in the opposite direction until the disc catches the ratchet wheel, like all the others, and the cycle repeats. For this one, I had to adjust the oscillating frequency by adjusting the length of the rubber band. Another problem I had to deal with for this clock was that the workshop is so noisy most of the time from the water wheel that I wouldn't be able to hear a ringing bell. So instead, I experimented with some bamboo to create a high-pitched whistle, which I could affix to the mechanical oscillator and open to airflow on the hour. The quick back-and-forth whistling inspired me to stylize this one as a cuckoo clock. And I even made a little clay bird to poke out of the doors of a tiny bamboo hut when the hour struck. Finally, I needed some timers for cooking and chemistry projects. I could have just made some hourglasses, but one, they're boring, two, I don't have the time or means to blow any glass today, and three, they can't make any sort of signal to tell me something's done from far away. So what I did instead was make some small bells with wind-up mechanisms inside them that drove a flicker, kind of like the fire alarms at a school. From there, it was a simple matter of installing a peg on one of the clocks at the time of my choosing for the alarm to go off, specifying the hour, minute, or even second. When the hands reach those pegs, they'll cause the pegs to rise and release the catch holding the spring wound, so the alarm will start ringing until the spring unwinds. These should help me perform certain tasks a bit more efficiently. These were very quick and easy to make, consisting of little more than short bamboo covers and some sticks for shafts, pegs, and flickers, though the bells will have to wait until tomorrow. They'll make nice covers for the clock faces, though. I finished about when the sun went down and when my grandfather clock started clicking, so I tidied up around the base and got my clay parts cooking overnight before having dinner and getting ready for bed. Week 15, Day 2. Another day, another level of the solar tower. And it went pretty much the same as last time, but just a little higher up, and that was much more harrowing. I repositioned the scaffolding, lined it with mesh, and filled it with concrete over the course of the whole day. Otherwise, not a lot to write about, though my mind wandered from one thing to the other while I worked, as usual. 
I had a little time at the end of the day, though, to finish building my clocks, now that the bells, covers, and rubber bands were all finished. I installed them, but I'll have to concern myself with testing and calibration tomorrow. Week 15, Day 3 After my morning chores, I started working on sealing up the gaps in the cistern and building the floors for levels 2 and 3 since I forgot to get started on that a couple of days ago. As I went, I stopped every hour or so not just to switch out my line, but also to make sure my clocks were calibrated correctly with the sundial. I finished around lunchtime and had the rest of the day to myself. I had a look at my to-do list and decided to go on a walk through the forest, looking for a tree that produced some kind of resin to seal the dining room table with putting a small nick in each different tree I found, and occasionally taking notes on new ones. I figured that, once I found one with a good sap, I could tap it later, but I'll have to wait for the tree to scab over first, so I'll repeat this walk tomorrow. When I got back to base, with little better to do, I decided to add some of the new tree specimens I found to my catalog, and to make some more paper before getting ready for bed. Short day. Week 15, Day 4 It was another down day, waiting for lime. During my morning forage, I checked on the various trees I scratched and examined the resin produced. Fortunately for my project, I found one that produced a clear amber resin that'll probably be adequate for sealing my dining room table and probably other pieces of furniture as well. So I set that tree tapping before continuing with my chores. There wasn't a lot for me to do today, but since the tower was almost finished, I decided it was probably a good idea to start testing the levels completed thus far for leaks. This was also a good opportunity for me to test the pumping apparatus I built last week. It took a fair amount of elbow grease to get the thing primed, but I was able to raise seawater up to the different levels. So I spent the morning filling the cisterns and checking for leaks as I went starting with the one at the top, and emptying down into the levels underneath, so I didn't accidentally break the foundation first. Also saves me a little time and energy. I found several leaks in the cisterns and piping, and sealed them up with grout and latex respectively as I went. After lunch, I checked on the resin and collected what had been produced so far. I noticed one problem was that the resin coagulated a bit too easily, as it's meant to so I needed some kind of solvent to keep it liquid, just like I had to do with the latex. Makes sense now. I considered using the ethanol I distilled, but I wasn't sure what chemical reactions that would have undergone with the resin, if any. There was one solvent I knew would work, however, and I knew how to make it, turpentine, which is produced by distilling tree resin. I decided to take the resin I had and spend some time distilling it, the resulting turpentine, however, would be somewhat toxic, so I was glad that I went to all the trouble of making my entire lab one big fume hood. I cooked the resin for about an hour until I got a clear, strong-smelling liquid out of the distiller, which I immediately sealed. One, because it's toxic and smells terrible, and two, because it would evaporate away if exposed, so I couldn't just pour it into my resin tap like I did with the latex. I also noticed a dark, gummy liquid left behind at the bottom of the distilling pot, which I tried my best to scrape out so the pot would be clean for later. It had a strong, kind of pleasant smell, and I determined that this was rosin, the leftover, non-volatile components of the resin, which soon cooled into a hard, amber-like chunk. It was certainly pretty, but I didn't know of any uses for it outside of being used as a flux and solder and being applied to the bows of violins, for reasons I never fully understood. I couldn't do much more until tomorrow, when I'll have more resin, so I spent the remainder of the afternoon describing a few of the insect specimens I've seen on the island, and making some more paper before going to bed. Week 15, Day 5 Today I built the final level of the cistern, so I was kind of excited. 
It was still a concrete day, though, so there isn't a lot to write about. Raised scaffolding, lined with mesh, lunch, raised aggregate, mixed concrete, filled in. It just took longer than any of the days before, because I had to spend even more time going up and down with the elevator, so I barely finished by the end of the day, exhausted but satisfied. The only other major thing I did today was get more resin while I was out foraging. I left it in my turpentine mixture all day to help it dissolve. Week 15, Day 6 I'm almost done with the cistern. I couldn't quite start using it in its full capacity yet, but after my chores, I spent the morning building some safety rails on the very top level, where the kiln is. I really appreciated this level because it was going to make working with and around the kiln so much easier and safer than when I was using that rickety, suspended platform. Another great thing about being done with this project is that I don't have to be switching out lime every hour on the hour anymore, especially six stories up in the air without a floor. I've never been a big fan of heights, so having the support rails helped me feel much more at ease up there, and I made sure they were quite strong, and high enough that I couldn't back into them and tip over the edge by accident. About chest height. However, in the middle of cutting up the necessary bamboo for this project, my axe broke, so I had to stop and build a new one. As I went, and when I finished, I took the time to enjoy the terrific view from way up there of the ocean and the forest. No boat or plane is going to miss seeing this thing. I admired all the other things I'd built from up there too. My kitchen, my lab, the gardens, the workshop. It's all very encouraging to get a literal overview of how far I've come. Back home, I used to feel almost content with letting all the things I thought of and imagined remain on the drawing board, because I wasn't skilled enough or equipped enough to make them. Now, I find myself feeling as though there's nothing I can't accomplish if I set my mind to it. It kind of makes me forget about feeling lonely. And I mean that in more than just the fact that it keeps my mind off being stranded. It just occurs to me that while all these materials were, in one way or another, available at home, there's no way I could have ever built anything like this at home, either because working to keep food on the table kept me too busy, or chiefly because someone would come along and tell me I couldn't, because the land didn't belong to me, or because it inconvenienced someone, or even because it wasn't pretty or was just unusual and would drive down property values or some other such malarkey. Out here, though, there's no one to bother, and no one to bother me. I am aware that this sentiment is technically a danger to my survival, and every survival book you'd ever read would tell you to drive out this thought with a pitchfork. But I'm starting to like it here. I'm starting to not want to get rescued. I have to brush that off, though, because anyone flying overhead is going to see a giant, shiny, clay flower and come to investigate, at which point I can decide whether I want to be rescued or not. I'll worry about it when the time comes, basically. Anyway, after finishing the railing, I spent a little more time this morning hooking up the last remaining sections of the water pumping system and testing for leaks before having lunch, starting another load of paper, writing, and relaxing for the rest of the day. Week 15, Day 7 It's Sabbath, and while the solar tower isn't quite done yet, I'm taking a break today. Besides, the concrete is still curing. After my morning chores, I decided to finish the furniture varnishing project I also remembered that wood generally needs some kind of oil to look shiny, so while I was out foraging, I grabbed some Polynesian chestnuts, because while they go bad very quickly, they contain a very nice oil for lamps, or in this case, wood varnishing. I made a quick and dirty oil press out of a couple pieces of bamboo and cleared the table to get started. I also took a moment to build a proper paintbrush, again using my own hair. I really needed a trim anyway. It must look frightful, though, having had to cut it with a razor blade. 
but I didn't really care anymore because I was somewhere between the itchiness behind my ears and neck driving me crazy and starting to get used to it. I spent a couple of hours varnishing the table, leaving the brush to soak in a little bit of leftover turpentine so it wouldn't get sticky, before having lunch, though I obviously couldn't eat it at the dining room table at the time. I then spent the rest of the afternoon preparing another load of paper, writing, and taking a short break in the middle to take a walk, looking for new specimens to describe. A restful day indeed. At the end of the day, I remembered I still had some sewing to do for my little Yachty doll, the colored threads now long dried, so I spent the evening sewing in the features for the face by hand, particularly lacing the blue threads in a radial pattern from the center of the eyes to create the appearance of an iris. It took me back to when I made the first doll with the same process. Sitting alone for hours upstairs, listening to corny old black and white Sherlock Holmes films or documentaries on church history, wanting to soak my love and values into these fibers, into the little person I wanted to create, just like I soaked them in dye. It was a good, if somber, trip down memory lane, and while this doll obviously didn't turn out quite to the same standard as my old one, I'm actually kind of okay with that. It kind of gives this one its own unique personality, which was something I'd always made up my mind to be okay with. The Yachty I wanted to build was never going to be the same as the one in my head, and that would have been unfair anyway. I made up my mind to let her decide who she wanted to be. No expectations, no strings attached, and just join her for the trip, giving directions primarily when asked. I suppose that's no different from how you should treat a normal kid. Just hard when you have to juggle that against work, bills, cooking, and cleaning, and they don't have enough perspective to work with you. Parents don't get enough recognition for how hard their real job is. And although my sibling always seemed to show contempt for the idea, well, as the Tin Man said, I still want one. I'm kind of rambling now. It's getting late. I should go to bed. Blooper reel. After that, it was a simple process of the second wheel turning the minute hand one increment once in, once a revolution. After that, it was a simple process to make the sec to make a second wheel turning the minute hand once an one to turn. It was a simple process to make the second wheel turn the minute hand one increment per revolution of the second hand, and, and the minute hand turning the hour hand once every one increment per one increment once per one increment per revolution. I need to re I need to rewrite this. Bleh. Pause. <coughs> Excuse me. After my morning chores, I decided to finish the furniture varnish. I decided to finish the furniture var- the furniture for sure and for sure and for sure and sure. Unpause. Where the heck was I? This hands, hands, hands. But modified the flicker mechanism so it moved the. I then spent the rest of the afternoon preparing another load of paper, writing, taking a short break in the middle to take a walk, looking for new in, looking for new specimens to describe. I, there should be an and in there somewhere. Hold on. Edits. Pause for edits. Because I was somewhere between. Because I was somewhere between the itchiness. Be, because I was somewhere between the itchiness. Be, unpause. I'll make you all a deal. If this week turns out too short, I'll sing a song for you at the end. Pause for edits. Unpause. Week 17. What? Week 7. No, we're not there yet. Alright, back up. More ed. <laughs> More. Or as typos. <sighs> Unpause. Why do I feel so lightheaded? Hey there. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. It tells the YouTube algorithm that I'm worth your time. The tower is so close to being done. I should have it finished by next week for sure, along with a little something just for fun. So, if you want to find out what it is, you can press the subscribe and bell buttons, and I'll set the alarm on my clock to chime as soon as it's ready. A 
assuming I can stay on time. Now, I'm not doing YouTube for money, and I don't plan on doing so anytime soon, but it would still help me out more than anything else if you could share this video with someone you think would enjoy it. You'd really be giving me a hand. And since you liked it enough to watch it this far in, you can press the like button to say so, and I'll do what I can to get you a present. There's also a dislike button you can press if you didn't like the video, or all of my bad time puns. But if you watched this long and didn't like it, I think you've only wasted your own time. Or are you just trying to save face? Also, if you'd like to share your own stories and perspectives on the episode, or more terrible puns, feel free to share them in the comments section below. I genuinely love to hear them, and I'm always open to suggestions and corrections. That said, thanks again for listening, and since I promised you a song, I'd like to share with you a chiptune I like called Future Kitchen by Tempest. Link in the description. I made some lyrics for it a while back, and I think about them a lot in the context of Yachty or any of my potential future children, as something I want them to understand about how I feel towards them, and it seemed appropriate for what I've written here today. Apologies in advance for the one-man a cappella, as I couldn't figure out how to get the tune to sound right on Audacity with the recording equipment I had. Hopefully, this will sound just as good in its own way. Sometimes we fight and argue, but never doubt how much I love you. Sometimes I make mistakes and don't know that I've hurt you, but know with all your heart that I still love you anyway. Sometimes you make mistakes and don't know that you've hurt me, but know with all your heart that I still love you anyway. There's nothing you can do to ever make me love you less, child. There's nothing you can do to ever make me love you less. There's nothing you can do to ever make me love you less, child. There's nothing you can do to ever make me love you less.